welcome to NORED. This is a celebration of NORED. Rod Robbie, his life and work, November 2007, our very first guest speaker. We're going to show that session to you, but before we do that, I have a small introduction where I'll be joined by David Craddock and Jonathan Hughes. And following the session, we have some special guests, Caroline Robbie, Jeff Smith, Jamie Wright, and Chris Sanders. I'm Silvio Baldessera, chairman of NOR. And 15 years ago, I started a continuing education program to bring the best architects and engineers as guest speakers for NOR, staff and guests to their Toronto office. Today, 110 guest speakers later, we virtually have expanded NORED to our 14 global offices, guests, friends, and students at 14 schools of architecture globally, and record all sessions and post them on NORED YouTube. While I host the NORED sessions, I have a dedicated team behind the scenes that today I want to introduce to you and thank them. And I'd like them to come on screen. Patricia, Christina, and Ilana, please come on screen. Patricia manages the guest speakers globally from start to finish with the agreements, the bio descriptions, the talk, issuing the electronic nor ed invites. Thank you, Patricia. Christina Mendes who does all of our creative graphics for NORED, starting with the program invites, the live NORED sessions, editing and recording and posting the NORED YouTubes within a few days, and the live production of the NORED, Ilana Dudu, who keeps the speakers, the slides, the panelists and the audience and me on track, on time, and always from the Toronto office, connecting sometimes worldwide through Zoom links and records all of the sessions. Thank you to all three of you. There's no way I could do this without you. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you also to the NORED committee that nominates the guest speakers yearly from each of our NOR offices, including Andrew Schmidt, Tobias Fellows, Jan Steinus, and Hassan Safarini from the Canadian offices, Chad Menard, Rachel Turner-Lack from the US offices, and Kevin Cooper from the UK offices. We're certainly uh, busy right now locking in the 2023 guest speakers. And now I wanna bring two NOR guests that helped me through the years hosting NORED. Welcome David Craddock and Jonathan Hughes, Please come on screen. And David Craddock graduated in 1970 from Penn State University in economics and architecture from the University of Toronto in 1979. David worked as a sole proprietor until 2005, and he was elected OAA president in 2006 and 2007 and served on council through 2010. Meanwhile, he, in 2008, he joined NOR as a project manager in the transportation sector and also was elected to the RAIC board. He served as RAIC president in 2012 and the RAIC syllabus program director in 2015. Upon retirement, he continues to work on syllabus and intends NORED programs and enjoys sailing. Jonathan Hughes, graduated from Manitoba University Bachelor of Architecture as his second degree to music and his previous life as a professional musician. In 2002, Jonathan started at Giffels and then transferred in 2004 to manage the Kingston Nor office. And then in 2006, moved again to take over the small Nor office in Ottawa. In the 10 years that Jonathan was in Ottawa, he built a significant NOR office and presence in the public building and government sector with projects like the 180 Wellington and Sir John A. Macdonald. In 2015, Jonathan returned to the NOR Toronto office and 
oversaw the Eastern Canada business. In 2020, Jonathan was promoted to Chief Operating Officer responsible for the 14 NOR Global Offices. Welcome to both of you. Thank so you I'm going to start, start with uh, David, who, after I started uh, the NOR, or the guest speaker series at NOR, uh, David graciously agreed to host the session. So David, please tell us about those early days of the guest speaker series. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. I'm indeed pleased to join as a panelist and bring back, because it brings back for me a lot of vivid memories of uh, my professional life, which was sort of going downhill like most sole practitioners in 2005 and six. And um, I joined OAA Council as part of a reform council because we were embroiled in something called Bill 124, which for the younger members who are today, uh, you wouldn't know about, we all did, because this was the government stepping forward and saying to architects and engineers, you no longer can talk to a building official or submit a building permit. Hmm. That was my livelihood. And uh, I had a, what I thought an embarrassing moment when back in 2005, I found myself sitting in the Coliseum down in the town with about 1,500 mostly architects and engineers. And we were sitting there nervously trying to pass uh, the exam so I could get a BCIN number and then go back to being able to submit a building permit. So I had a couple of nervous months just like it was when I was back at, say, University of Toronto, back feeling like a student. And uh, it was amazing, but I'm sort of digressing. But it was just very much the way I think a teacher or a nurse probably feels in 2022. Uh, the world's collapsing. One day uh, in 2006, when I was OAA president, I got a call from a guy, Pat Quinn, a very Irish firebrand mechanical, or, sorry, structural engineer, Quinn Dressen, who invited me to lunch. So we went to lunch, and then he said, starting off, I want $10,000 from you and your council's permission to join the PEO, because we're going to sue the government. So he said, oh, so we had a good lunch, and I went to my council, and to my surprise and the horror of the OA council and many members, we agreed. So then Pat took me to PEO council where I saw what he was doing. He said to them, we need to join the OAA to sue the government. I need $50,000 and your support. And they didn't know what to do with Pat. So they agreed. So we went and hired, as he said, the best lawyer I know. We sued the honorable attorney general, uh, Michael Bryant. And to everybody's surprise about a year later, we won. And for once again, I didn't have to put a BCN number on my permit drawings along with my stamp. I could just use my stamp and sign it. But where it really came home was Pat mentioned that when he took the BCN exam, he signed the affidavit at the bottom saying he did it to the best of his knowledge, and then probably moved his slide rule away, got out his stamp and stamped the application and, and signed that saying they could better get used to seeing my stamp because it's going to be back. That was the way Pat Quinn was. So anyway, that's how we started. And that was actually, I'd say, my real introduction to lifelong learning because immediately after winning, the government, who were annoyed at losing a court case, uh, the Attorney General wouldn't speak to us any longer, um, started saying, well, what are you guys going to do to make your members current, knowledgeable, and proving that you have the public trust. So we started trying to work out Con Ed and the OEA did. PEO had a little more difficulty because they have so many disciplines, but uh, you know they were, they were very supportive. Then out of the blue in 2008, I'll say this, I got a call from Silvio and uh, that's when he asked me to join NOR. And uh, by then I'd had numerous lectures from Pat Quinn telling me that what I needed to do was get used to integrating my services with my mechanical and my structural consultants, my interior designers, and act more like a design team. 
and that if I wanted to be anything in the world as a good architect and do good buildings, I needed to have an integrated practice. I went, hmm, 38 years, I'd never had an integrated practice. I was a sole practitioner. That was the way I practiced. Then as they say in 2008, April, I got a call from an old friend, Silvio, who invited me to come to NOR and work on TTC projects as a project manager. So I did. And I'll tell you, within the first year, I understood what Pat had been saying, what integrated design was about, because I had an engineer, a structural, Ron Pugh, who I could always walk down and say, why did you do this? And he'd say, well, 20 years ago, I built that tunnel. And sure enough, that's why it was done. So what I'm getting at, I got introduced backhanded to integrated design. I also got hooked on uh, Silvio's lecture series because I started listening to speakers. Rick Hall can be who he knew, George Baird, but Greg Solomon was one that strikes out who talked about casinos. I learned a lot. And over those first year or two, I learned things I never learned in my daily practice as an architect because I was listening to engineers, interior designers, and specialists with knowledge. It improved me. Silvio asked me to, to introduce them, and I was actually nervous at first, but I got to enjoy it. It was fun. And, David, David, you did, a, yeah. you did an excellent job. Wow. Uh, and that. No, it's just right. by then I was you'd been used to being at OE Council <laughs> and being heckled by architect <laughs> members. At least there you weren't heckled. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you did, a, that's, you did an excellent job until Jonathan. You, <laughs> oh, I know. Anyway, so anyway, it, Jonathan, I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> uh, it was all good. But anyway, but as we went on, the day I really remember was one day Silvio invited me in the office and he had, as you do when you're an employee, uh oh, and he goes, I've got an idea. We're going to change the format and call it NORED. And he had some graphics, spiff it up. And, you know, we're going to make this into a full fledged program. Luckily, I, I agreed with him on the selection of the logo. And that's the one we use. And I've, I've learned to love it ever since the colors and everything. So it all worked out and we switched. And then what you could see in the audience too is a gradual shift where it wasn't just our NOR employees. Uh, we were suddenly picking up Ottawa employees uh, watching and our customers were actually enjoying it. Then the light went on. It was like, as Bill Baker said last week, it was my Eureka moment when I realized that one of the problems I was facing at the OAA was how do we deliver meaningful Con Ed that um, our members can sign up for and show that they're current, interested in education and being well-rounded. So I got in touch with our education director, uh, Alana, who is still at Savinsky. She's still working at the OA, bless her, sort of like Patricia and whatnot. And over a course of a year, Nor started using the form that we're still using today, where you sign up with learning objectives and the OEA will say, you'll get X number of points, da -da 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 -da. but it was a really a win-win for us because after about a year with uh, Geraldine and, and Patricia having to send in the forms to the OEA, they got to a point where they said, we believe you. Why don't you just keep the forms and just tell us who got points or they can report them themselves. So what I'm getting at, within a space of two years, the program had sort of uh, elevated itself to the point where it was recognized by the OAA and actually became the model that they still use today for companies, other speakers, to do qualified uh, NORAD, NORAD points and Con Ed points. It became the system that became what the province did because what they recognized was it was education and it demonstrates that architects, they were surprised, were willing to spend time and, and many times actually money, their own money, to stay current to serve the public. So then, as he said, I went to RAC and that's when I met Jonathan because 
Jonathan was gainfully there. And uh, so he got the joy because I was traveling with RSC to be Mr. Noren. Jonathan. <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks, Silvio. Thanks, Thanks for inviting me to be a panelist. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to be brief. I think there were sort of four points that I was going to bring up about my experience with uh, with NORED and and I suppose even with Silvio, I think David, you the way you conveyed your your recruitment, and I'll put that in loose quotations into the NORED is Silvio tends to have bright ideas and grabs the people around him. And I was reporting to him at the time, so I kind of I kind of was voluntold in many ways <laughs> on one of his brilliant ideas. I think it was probably on a Friday afternoon in a in a in a drinking establishment. But regardless, it was a it was an excellent idea, and I think. The fact that we were able to legitimize it with the OAA brought a lot of um, a lot of really strong um, legitimacy to the program, and and has helped to ha has helped to propel it into the 15-year history that it that it really has. So, I was very impressed with your ability, David, to to help stick handle that and and convince a somewhat difficult organization. I I always uh, viewed them as as uh, uh, um, to to actually approve our. Our uh, our efforts and and Silvio's efforts in the NORED, so that was that was the one thing. The second thing is I I was up in Ottawa, and um, the the brilliant idea, the other brilliant idea that Silvio had was that you know this would be a great way for us to um, to invite clients who were you know under you know reasonably strict policies of not 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 commiserating with uh, with their consultants, and this was an educational situation and. Uh, the government was very was very supportive of it, and there was a lot of of um, uh, interest and in, and in, and architects that also were able to uh, take advantage of the core points that the OAA was offering, and it allowed us to to come into a more relaxed environment with some of our clients and really just sort of understand and 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 get to know them and have them get to know Nor and and our group up up in Ottawa. So it really was a a great business development, and 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 I've made lifelong uh, friendships with many of the the people at Public Works, um, and largely due to some of these um, organizational situations that Nor NORED was able to provide. So that that was the the number two. I think the third brilliant idea that Sylvia looked at was that uh, all us young aspiring principals who were looking up to fathers Baldessera with. Uh, eager eyes and thinking we could really uh, rule the world and take over our, our sectors and win projects and this sort of thing. Well, he forced us all to get up in front of the group and, and uh, do, a, do a, a long NORAD presentation. And it was a bit daunting to try to put material together that would last for an hour and try to keep keep the audience captivated and have some interesting and compelling discussion afterwards so that uh, I think that sort of um, was another um, learning experience and something that was really contributing to the the whole NORED uh, initiative and many of us I think have gone on and become uh, you know espousers in our own rights and can't wait to get on the soapbox and, and usually we can't shut ourselves up so uh, thank you Silvio for that as well um, and then I think the fourth one is just how it's evolved uh, 15 years and I was sort of responsible for four for roughly four of those years somewhere in the, in the middle years between 2015 2014 and 2019 um, and you know I was bringing in friends that I knew and and people that were within the Ontario uh, community um, respected and and so forth but you know the the potential that that Silvio and the group and the committee and ha have been able to to nurture out of those small beginnings of NOR into something that now attracts hundreds of people to these um, to these um, uh, um, educational sessions and worldwide is is really phenomenal and something that that certainly I'm very proud of but certainly um, I would say that Silvio and others that are are involved have have to be very proud of the 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 uh, where where he's taken it where where this has gone and I'm I'm just really interested in in where the next 15 years will will take the the uh, the session so thank you very much for the opportunity to to speak uh, David and Jonathan thank you very much I wanted to have you on because you definitely were a, a big part of of the 15 years it wasn't just me and much the same as what's happening right now we're going into a 
you know, a, a great direction with Nor Ed, and uh, definitely want to thank all the people that are working with me right now because it's it's not just me that's uh, uh, doing what we're doing with NORED and it's a great initiative and it's a great way to give back to the architectural engineering community out absolutely there. so thank you both very much so we're going thank to you. move on and thank you <laughs> for being on so we're going to move on and we're going to watch um, with great anticipation the very very first NORED speaker, Rod Robbie. First one is the launch. Um, and the objective of uh, the series is really to invite notable architects and engineers uh, to come to NOR to speak about the design uh, to NOR staff and friends. The series recognizes that NOR has collaborated, and most of you know that, uh, with a number of uh, outstanding architects and engineers over the years. They've kind of become known as um, signature architects. I'm not sure where that term came from. I don't really like it. Uh, but there are certainly people that are, uh, are renowned and, and definitely are notable. The series recognizes that NOR is an architectural and engineering firm. Uh, there is no fine line between architecture and engineering. It is one and it is design. And I think that uh, we do have to get back to uh, understanding design and talking about design. <clears throat> so in 2008, uh, starting in January, every the first Monday of each month at four o'clock, we're going to hold a guest uh, speaker series. Um, and we're just putting together our roster uh, for that and uh, we'll issue that to, to staff and uh, plan to be there, put it in your diaries, uh, in your outlook, um, and hope to see you there. Our guest speaker today is an architect who has spent, and I'd like to say continues to spend <coughs> his life in the pursuit of, and if most of you have read uh, Tim Collins' Good to Great, um, it's exactly what he's doing. It's not just good architect architecture, but finding great architecture. Norris collaborated with him um, on the world's first uh, stadium with a retractable roof. And since that time, we've had a relationship <coughs> with him for over the last uh, 23, 24 <coughs> years. He's a partner and a friend of NOR. <coughs> Our guest speaker is Rod Robbie. And when I asked Rod if he would do this, he typically said, if you're asking, I'll do it. <laughs> Which was very nice of him. Then the second thing I asked him is that I needed a biography, and he said, what's that? <laughs> uh, so he actually sent me a biography, but I edited it. <laughs> so, Rod graduated in 1950 and was licensed as an architect in 1951 when he joined the Chief Engineers Department of the Eastern Region British Railways until 1956. During that time, Rod designed a fully flexible modular steel traffic office equipment system, which was used by the British Railway system nationally and it was still in use in the early 1990s. Rod immigrated to Ottawa, Canada, in 1956, where he worked briefly, and I've highlighted briefly, for Public Works of Canada, before joining um, a small architectural practice in Ottawa, Belcourt and Blair. There, Rod designed the Boy Scouts Association headquarters building in Ottawa. The building was the first fully precast concrete office building. It featured modular planning approach to design. It was one of the first air conditioned office buildings in Ottawa. <clears throat> but unfortunately, Rod's days at that firm were limited because he was recruited by Peter Dickinson in 1958 and Rod actually ran the office in Ottawa uh, at that point. 
He was the lead architect and town planner on the new town for Fogarshire Bay, Baffin Island, the centerpiece of Prime Minister Diefenbaker's Dream of the North. Rod moved to Toronto in 1961, admitting to me recently that he really couldn't hack Ottawa. Had to get us. <laughs> he was the founding partner when he, when he came to Ottawa of Ashworth, Robbie, Vaughn, Williams, architects, and town planners. And I think that you probably recognize a few names in there. I spent some time with Fred Ashworth um, uh, at a previous firm, and uh, it was Colin Vaughn, who uh, most of you know from City TV. That firm, like Knorr, uh, went through nine iterations in total and ended up with Robbie Sane Architects uh, in 2004. So if you take a look at Rod Robbie's good to great designs, they include the Canadian Government Pavilion at Expo 67, the Metropolitan Toronto School Board Study of Educational Facilities, otherwise known as SEF, the Toronto Sky Dome, and not to be called in this room, the Rogers Centre. <laughs> His accomplishments are, are many, and as you saw, has a, a, lot, a lot of letters after his name, and he's definitely earned every single one of them. But the one that's probably the, um, uh, sits right at the top next to his name is the Order of Canada. Uh, he holds an honorary doctorate of law from Dalhousie University, is a fellow of Ryerson University, is a fellow of the REIC, has been awarded the Order of Da Vinci by the OAA, and I would like to ask Rod Robbie, my friend, to come up and speak on his favorite subject, my life as an architect. Please welcome Rod Robbie. Well, well I, found, I found that really quite moving because a, I don't know anything about design, so what, what, what this is, is what happens to you if you uh, get recruited into this profession by accident and you end up, you know, half, half a century or more later still doing it because you can't figure out what else you could do, you know, so um, this is about the truth of my life. So what I'm going to start with, I'm going to show you some pictures on here. Um, you say, well, what the hell's that got to do with architecture? But you see, what I want to do is to say where I came from, uh, because this man didn't tell me about design. He said, just tell us, tell us what happened to you, you know. So at any rate, my, all my family were in the British Merchant Marine, and this is one of my uncle's sh ships, or one of my uncles was the chief engineer of this thing, being launched before the war, anyway. And the other thing that was very central to our lives was, again, because of the Merchant Marine um, engines. This is a, a, a triple expansion steam engine, which I knew all about when I was like a, a schoolboy. Um, and my, my fate was going to be to run these things in, in uh, cargo ships. The other person who had a great deal to do with my life was this gentleman, who you probably have all seen before. Um, and uh, the, the problem being that he decided to attack our country and we lived on the south coast so we got the beneficial treatment of his bombing uh, until we blew him away. So anyway, it was uh, very pleasant of him. And the other thing that had a great effect on, our, on my life, or at least uh, worrying about it, was this thing, which of course is the Bismarck, um, which had it got away in the Atlantic, uh, we would have probably starved to death but uh, it didn't, so, but he, they managed to sink the hood and a few other things along the way, but at any rate, it got sunk. Um, now, the other, coming to architecture, um, I should add that I got into architecture, be, we, I was 15, and my mother said, what are you going to do? And I came from a, quite a poorly off family. The, my father was a fitter in a shipyard. My mother had been a barmaid. Um, that's where they met. He was drinking it and she was serving it, you know. <laughs> and uh, then he served something to her and I'm the result, you know. So, so anyway, um, the, uh, the, the upshot was that she said, well, you've got to do something, you know. So 
Um, you know, and it, my, my imagination, bear in mind the war was on, it was 1944, and the, my imagination, or 43 actually then, ran as far as, um, you know, working in a shipyard or going to sea as a marine engineer, uh, which I'd been told I wasn't going to be allowed to do by my, my father. So I, uh, apparently the school board, not the school board, but the, the uh, public authority that uh, ran the education system in Southampton, where I came from, in the south of England, um, gave away scholarships. And at this particular season, they had two very interesting possibilities. The first was called being a barber, which is cutting men's hair. And of course, in those days, men didn't wash their hair. So it was kind of a smelly occupation. Um, but it didn't, that didn't bother me so much because we all smelled. Um, and the, but the, the other part was, uh, the other idea was architecture. Now, the, the trouble with that was that I didn't know what architecture was. Um, so I asked my mother, I was very interested in engineering, particularly bridges. So my, I said to my mother, do architects do bridges? She said, of course they do. She didn't have a clue. She just said yes. So I went in for the scholarship and won it, and I'm here. That's how I got here. So um, I went to a place called the Southern College of Art, and there was a German lecturer there who was an emigre from the Bauhaus, and he realized I didn't know what I was doing. And we were in Winchester. We'd been evacuated there to avoid the bombing in Portsmouth, where the school was located. And he said, go and look at this building, which is Winchester Cathedral, and understand the space, the, the structure, the, the, the refinements, you know, the decoration and so on, and the light, and the way the space is organized. Um, I made this drawing when I was about 16 of this building because I spent half my life there. Now this fine building here, um, when I got to the school, the, um, the, I discovered that, well, I went to the school late, and the, 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 uh, the rest of them knew what they were doing, and they were like three or four months into the mission. And we were given a job, which was to draw our view or our idea of a city hall. This was my idea of a city hall. Um, so it was in December 1944. Um, and the lecturer very kindly described it as a municipal muck heap, which I've always, I've always uh, treasured. Pardon all the crap on this slide, but this, this was typical of the drawings we had to do in that school. This, as you can see, is the Parthenon. This was done in ink and whatever, and it took hours and hours. And we, this was a funny school in that it, uh, it was part of an art school. You would design a building, and you had for a library. Um, again, it, it, half the trick was to make these drawings look presentable. This was a typical piece of work in the third year. Um, and again, you know, you can see this rather this rather old-fashioned South of England feel to it. Um, I was conscripted into the British Army, um, you know, because everybody had that fight, and you did your national service. And this was the, this was a sketch I made of the village outside our camp where I was sent to train in the Royal Engineers in surveying, which was mostly. A, uh, an excuse to spy on all the countries around the canal zone in the Middle East. Um, well, at least I was just a, a private in that organization. However, it did have the enormous advantage that I was able to travel extensively in Egypt. And this was a photograph I took with a couple of other guys um, in the southern part of the country. Um, I came out, I got a scholarship to the Ring Street Polytechnic, which was in London, um, and it was a very good school. Uh, there was a small problem. My father was dying, and uh, um, so it, the program was two years, fourth and fifth year. I got there, I came out of the army, and uh, I made a deal with the chief lecturer. It, uh, if I could skip the fourth year and just go to the fifth year, he'd make it easy. Like He, he wouldn't make it easy, but he'd tolerate it. So this this was my thesis. It was a shipyard, and you have you know, a factory and all the rest of it. So then here it is in the model form. Um, also at that time, I was interested in furniture. And another guy and myself designed this chair, which we did in 1950. And it's made of resin-bonded fiberglass, 
it was for a competition for the Festival of Britain, which we didn't win. Um, but it seems sort of reminiscent of one made in the United States, which we didn't even know about at the time. However, he did well, we didn't. Um, <laughs> we, that's about the only one that existed, and Lord knows where it is. Uh, I went on a trip with my wife, who I married in 1952, or we married, I should say, in 1952, and I saw a three-legged chair at El Greco's house in Toledo, in Spain, and this, uh, this thing came out of it. I, I wouldn't advise you sit on it. It was entirely unstable, you know. You just lean a bit to the left or right and you're on your face, you know. Um, this, uh, at the same time, being a workaholic, um, I and my friend both entered the planning school, which was run at night. So this was, this was a scheme for a, a housing project in Roehampton, which is in the south part of London. And this was the Elephant and Castle. We were trying to replan it which is a big mess, and it's still a big mess. But you can see, that's where it is in the bend of the river in London. Anyway, this was the first job I did for British <coughs> Rail. It was a <coughs> ticket office on Victoria Street, which I you know, burned my guts out on, as you can imagine, um, with great care. And about uh, 25, 30 years later, I took my daughters down there to, s to show them Daddy's first job. And I couldn't find the building, but more particularly, I couldn't find the street because they'd knocked the whole lot down. The street was gone, the buildings were all gone, they'd re realigned it. It was Victoria Street, so that's a, that's a piece of history. This was another piece. This is inside King's Cross Station where I was working. And on the right here is a piece of the Victorian station that was uh, we attached to. This was uh, the, the railway advertisement for the festival. Um, we we had a very Miesian outlook on what we did at that time, partly because it was simple and partly because it was cheap, um, and we had no money. Uh, this is in one of these dismal railway depots in the east end of London. So this was a canteen. This was our biggest building at the time. Um, this, was, this was the Norwich Thorpe ticket office in uh, Norwich in the eastern part of the country. Again, you can see this sort of very simple thing inside this very ornate Victorian building, which we were trying to integrate it with in some fashion or other uh, without having to go to the cost of the original building. Uh, the other thing I, I got heavily involved in was master planning at that time. This was about 1954, 53. This is the port of Harwich, and this is where the train ferries and cargo ships go from. So all of that, this whole big piece, this little bit down here is the town, but all the rest of it was railway land except for that, that uh, village that we just wrapped all this industrial stuff around. Um, this was the last project I worked on. Uh, this was a slightly ambitious job to join together Euston Station, which is here, uh, Somerstown Goods Yard, where the British Library is now, um, King's Cross Station, which is on the left, and then St Pancras Station, which is the one that's sticking out the front there. And the idea was to join these two railways together. One went up the east side of the country and the other up the west side and put this humongous station in between with a whole mass of development on the roof of it. Of course, being Britain, nothing happened. Um, this, this was typical of the equipment that we were building, which was made of oak and it had a tremendous amount of detail in it inside all these drawers. It doesn't look very impressive because everything was on a very low budget. Uh, and then the last project I worked on was this thing, which seemed to work quite well. This was this containerized furniture system, which was based on these boxes into which you could fit drawers or cupboards. And then into that, you could fit all the multitudinous pieces of paper and stuff that they had to run this railway at the time. And this system, as Silvio mentioned, uh, was still in use about 30 odd years after it was developed. It worked quite well. And it was probably one of the first containerized furniture systems. This was, this was the Boy Scouts headquarters before it got butchered. Um, somebody saw on all the sunbreakers off it. But what I tried to do in this, this building was completely modular. And at British Rail, 
Um, the, the guy who was the deputy architect was a leader in modular construction and was the person who, who metricized the British, the entire British uh, construction system. Um, and so I learned a great deal from this guy. So when I got to Canada, I was very interested in modular construction and systems. And so this thing was based on a, on a, on a four foot planning grid and a one foot um, detail grid. Um, and the attempt was to control um, summer sunlight to not heat the place up inside too much to run this air conditioning system that was quite a hard thing to get there. Um, and as Sylvia mentioned, this building was completely precast, except for some stairs which stabilized it. This totem pole was the last one done by a, a chap on Queen Charlotte's Isle, which I unfortunately I can't remember his name. It was the last pole he carved, and it was probably the biggest. And it, they had to use special cars to get it across the country. The CP brought it here. The canopy was not like that after I left the firm. The, the original canopy was a hyperbolic par par paraboloid, uh, but the senior partner didn't like that too much, and he was a bit scared of it, so he changed it. Um, this, but as I say, this building is now a, a travesty of what it was. This is the town of Frobisher Bay on Baffin Island. Um, the, 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 the bay is down at the bottom of the picture. Uh, the town site was this thing on the left, and then this was the, this was the uh, Akalawit village. And then this was the extension, the powerhouse and the thing. And this is quite a big hill going up with a, there's a radar station on top. But the idea with this thing, it was a chain of buildings which all faced south. Um, it had virtually no, north was up the picture. And so it had virtually no windows on the back. Again, it, it, this was one of these schemes that there was a huge amount of work done on it, and then the government changed again, and it, like the Arrow Project, it disappeared into no man's land rather quickly when Mr. Pearson won. Um, the next job of any consequence, but in between times, I, I, I worked on tons of buildings, but a lot of them were schools, um, a lot of small industrial buildings, uh, and certain amount of residential. But then we won uh, this, which is the Canadian Pavilion Expo. And my colleagues and I, Paul Scholler and Matt Stankiewicz, uh, who were from the two other firms, uh, we had this joint venture to do this job. And we, um, we after a tremendous amount of work, we uh, um, settled on this rectangular 30-degree py pyramid as being the basic unit of space. So they were right way up, upside down, and so on to create the whole building. So this was the final model that was presented to the cabinet for final approval. This is it in the actual thing. So the, the Canadian site is all this in the bottom left of the picture. This is Ontario, Quebec. And then in the middle is Saskatchewan, where the prairie provinces, and then the, the Maritimes and the and the native people. But you can see these, this pyramidical structure. And the, the idea was to make something that was interesting, but cheap, um, and also would work. This, um, and bear in mind, the, the land was all artificial. It was about 20 odd feet of fill dug out of the subways in Montreal and thrown in the river. And it wasn't consolidated, so th this thing stood on caissons. The rest of it was founded on spread footings in all this, this stuff that was made up the site. So we had this, which um, as you can see, just consisted of these four girders, a, a bunch of legs under, and a plate to stop it from exploding. Um, and then the buildings, this, this was at just before it opened. It, you wouldn't believe it, but that was probably only about two weeks before it opened. Um, but they uh, they had uh, they they built this thing up in in short order. Um, the the building of uh, the, the the main exhibit was de designed by an exhibit team. So they made these models because we didn't have computer graphics to to study the exhibit, and they're all made of balsa wood. They're quite elaborate. Um, 
Now this is the test. Uh, what we figured on is if we could make the building out of wood, a lot of it was glue lamb, um, the bigger members in the real building were glue lamb, and then we used this uh, uh, polyvinyl chloride reinforced <coughs> fabric or uh, plastic sheet, because uh, we wanted to get a building that was translucent and this is a test structure built at the National Research Council in Ottawa to test how it would stand up through a winter because we had to build a building, it had to go through a winter and then it had to uh, be used. So this is what it looked like on the inside. The panel, the one in the middle, is the one with the fabric on. So it, it made for a very nice soft light. It looks great on here a bit. When it, after it had been there for a few months and years, it got rather filthy. Um, this is what the basic structure looked like. Um, you know, you know, the only thing you can't imagine on here is the temperature. It was about minus 60. You know. there was a, well, not that day, because you can see the steam is going straight up. But it, it, probably then it was about minus 35. But it was rather cold. But then the wind would blow, because this was in the middle of the St. Lawrence River. Um, that's part of our project in the distance. That's the arts building. <coughs> This is what it was like inside, um, with a brick floor which went all over the entire site and then this plastic covering. And so this, this building cost 6.4 million, it was 11 acres, um, and it was under budget and it was finished on time. This is inside the restaurant, which is in a steel building where we used the same, we used the same motive all through. This is uh, Eskimo carving or Inuit carving on the end wall. Oh, this picture is, this is my wife and these three little girls in yellow outfits are my daughters and the, the little one on the right, so a few years later she looked like this um, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we happened to be, this is how we normally dressed on the weekend, you know. Um, so this, so at, you know, after that I uh, left the, I was recruited um, to, um, to take on this project, which was a, a, a project to try and find a way of making buildings very quickly for the, um, for the school board, because they had a, a tremendous influx of children. They were getting around 43,000 new kids a, a year, new to the system, and the, the schools were inflexible. This school on the right, there's not a SEF school. This is a brochure that was done before the we, before we'd built anything, it was just when it was starting. This happens to be a school we did in, in northern New York State. Um, this funny looking thing here is, was my idea of the organization to, to get it started, you know, so we had all these pompous words at the end there and all this sort of stuff. And actually in the end we used a, a PERT system, this great long thing with uh, uh, critical path days, etc. Anyway, the system worked pretty well. It was a huge amount of work, but it, the idea was to try and get wide span buildings um, which would enable us to move anything anywhere. So this was, a, this was the test frame for the, for the first test structure. Um, we had the completely movable electrical system that you could shift around, and this was the heart of it was up in the, and it was all plugged in, so the, the plugs went into these, these things on the face of those boxes there, because the electrical union and the, and the contractors didn't like it too much, because um, it meant that laymen could uh, just change the electrical system in a building, you know, they, they just get in there and plug the red to the red and the blue to the blue, etc. Uh, this was the, this was a furniture system that we developed um, for use in the classrooms, which was sort of like this. So it, and th that is the, the lighting ceiling system and the wall system. Uh, it actually looked, uh, oh, we developed these environmental criteria sheets because there was none of this stuff available at that time. So we developed these to uh, work out what we needed. Um, this, this is a, interior of one of these schools. All the, all the wall panels are removable. You can take them off individually So, if you want to extend the building. The, the, the roof ceiling system, all of it was, was movable. 
this is the this is where these pogo poles came from. We developed this system of feeding the power from the top down. Um, the partition system was part of it, and then of course carpet. It, it, at the time, there was vinyl asbestos flooring everywhere, and we decided we where the school board said, you know, we want to, so the kids can run around on the, crawl around on the floor, because we were building mostly elementary schools, and so we developed after a tremendous bidding problem with wool and nylon and polypropylene and everything else you can imagine, we managed to get this. Um, but the other thing which came out of this SEF program was packaged air conditioning <coughs> units. Prior to this, they were nasty little tin cans on the roofs of cheap, um, malls and places and so we wanted to get large um, um, multi-zone units which we could move um, and so the buildings could be could be um, made so that they if they wanted to change the air condition they could actually t take it off and GM got a hold of this and they developed from it um, uh, their own sort of package unit not long after for use on, on the car plants or whatever, uh, and which were these big units, because no one had attempted to make these, these much higher grade units until we tried it on this program. This was typical of the wall system on the outside. All of, this can, all of those panels can be pulled out, pulled out individually if you wanted to. Now, of course, we went too far. Nobody ever used it. You know, like even when we put an extension on a SEF school, I think we took out one panel, you know. Like, so that was a waste of effort. Um, this, um, there's a great deal of wasted effort in architecture, I'll tell you, um, which I'm sure you know. Uh, this, was, um, this was the first um, community college for, for Seneca, uh, the original scheme. And we got this huge job, it was about 42 million. Uh, at the time, which was in the in the 60s, I, I was running the SEF program, and Colin Vaughan and John Andrews of Sacred Memory, in joint venture with Adamson and uh, Mathers and Hornby, our firm, and and the, you know John Andrews, etc., got this job as a joint venture, and so uh, the plan was that we had this like street with these buildings, and then you could build out laterally from them with either temporary buildings or permanent buildings. So the thing was like a, like a great big octopus thing. Um, the only problem was that both Colin and John Andrews told Dr. Minkler, who was the, pre the, the new chairman of this college, that he picked the wrong site. And um, Dr. Minkler didn't like that kind of criticism. He was also the head of the York, uh, North York School Board. So he fired us, you know, which... Uh, quite upset Mathers and Holmby. They got back in somehow. And then John Parkin, your ex-leader, ex uh, took over this job and he built a building on that awful site. And we figured we couldn't find a foundation under about a thousand feet. But anyway, he found one somewhere, built a concrete building. I spent a great deal of time when I was younger doing this kind of thing, which is this was drawn in Sarajevo before it all got blown up. Um, and this kind of thing. Uh, which I'm sure you've all done. So, um, and it, this is, I spent a, a certain amount of time in the 70s doing carving, and my wife was a painter. Um, and so she'd paint it, I'd cut it. This, this thing's on the wall in my living room at home. It's like eight feet by four feet. Uh, it's rather massive. It's made of cedar. And then that's a piece of it. Um, and this was another one we did. Um, and th there was a theory behind all these. Oh, this thing was, I, I, I was heavily involved in politics. So this, the, the idea of this thing was the leader in the lead. These are the lead down here. And here's the leader. Oh, he's off the paint. He's, he's, he's down on the margin of the screen there. It's a little, little red thing with a white top on it. But he has all these, he has all these protections between him and the people. Um, you can see where my views were coming from. Um, this was our entry <coughs> into the Edmonton City Hall competition, this thing in the middle there. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it was, it was like supposedly a gateway to the north. Actually, it probably freeze to death with a Venturi effect, you know. Fortunately, we didn't win. Um, this was um, 
This was my entry into the Tête de France competition in Paris, which we also didn't win. But the interesting thing was that um, I think only the guy who won and myself had this idea of an arch where the axis of Paris would go through and then turn where it went off towards the Seine. So th this idea here was that you'd have these gardens because if you've been to Tête de France or to the De, de France, it's just a mass of concrete and great big concrete buildings and there's like no vegetation there. So I thought it might be an idea to have a little bit. This is the back of it. Um, this, okay, this is where Skydome started. I put these in as it, uh, it's it sort of, this was at the planning stage uh, when, it, when it was a planning competition. So I, my thought was that you'd have this, the, the, it was based on a traffic idea of where, trying to figure out where it should be located. And, and this was a, actually if I go forward one and go back and then come back, this was the, this was the plan and I concluded that it should be in the downtown core near the railroad um, and but in a position where that big black dot is where it could form the end of a ceremonial route that went from there and then up University Avenue to the legislature so going backwards it so it, so the idea was that you had this this thing that you see at the bottom here was this this main mall coming along and Davis Square and you know <laughs> what well, how imaginatively and then some offices and the uh, the thing itself would be the, the the thing there and the Globe Mail building got nuked it was buried in the development there um, th there's the square there's the tower any anyway, rate there none of the other people were thinking about putting this thing downtown but af after the competition, um, IBI suddenly came up with the idea of putting it over next to the tower there, which kind of, you know, and the rest is history, as they say. But th this thing was, uh, the other idea with this was to try and separate the, the roads in, in level so as to actually get a square to the north of it, uh, which is actually off the, it's off the screen, um, where you could actually get Fort York in the square, so you could actually see it, um, which you can't see on here. Um, so did that, and, and then as you know, we all collaborated together to work on this thing, um, which you've all seen. Um, that was the model for the competition. Um, at that time, it would try to use the whole site. This this curvy piece on the front actually used all the available land, and as you know, it all got stripped off as it as it developed. Um, that was the site before we started. Uh, here's, the, here's the water plant and uh, down there with the tower in the middle of it. And then there was a roundhouse which has been demolished actually in this picture because there was a great, there were two big water pipes come under here and Ellis Don who got that job were digging to put in those pipes and also the pumping station which is on the left by the expressway there. Um, this is the building, of course, had a lot of influence on what it did, um, um, and uh, which you've all seen. Um, went and had a look at it twice. It was remarkably similar in, in many ways. The other was the, the old influence from, from way beyond. And so it thought that you know, maybe the, the basic system would be something like this. And so this was the original scheme, which sucked. It, uh, it, was, it was just like a great big Zeppelin hangar it was, you know, how you dealt with the end wall, it just didn't make sense. And so anyway, Michael brilliantly came up with this drawing, which was because we'd been dis trying to decide how you make the thing open and close. And so we had, nesting was, or telescoping rather, was the obvious way. Nesting was, was a function of that. And so by combining the two, you got that. So that was the antecedents of it. And the, the other part was, what shape should it be? Because they wanted to have baseball, um, football, and concerts. And so you ended up with a, a rectangular building laid on this. So it, it really meant it put that on top of there and you had to move the seats and the rest, of course, you know about. This was the relative size of the of Sky Dome and its, uh, its great-grandfather, you know. Um, 
the, um, this was a, a, a holy moment when the building had some color. Uh, after, when it was finished, we got everybody who worked on it to uh, put in a design using the primary colors that we'd used as the color scheme for the building, the interior, um, you know, for, for various recognition purposes. And people came up with their own designs. The only constraint was they couldn't use black or white, well, some white, but not black. And they couldn't, uh, and they couldn't use any other colors except the primaries. So they did this, and these went all around the building. But of course, they got lost and disappeared. And then, as Silvio mentioned, we worked together in, in RAN for many years. Um, and this was Frankfurt. It was one of the stadiums we, we, we actually won it. But it, of course, went south on us like the things tend to do. Um, this one was very flat because it was in the flight path of Frankfurt's main airport. It had a rollout field, which is rolling out here into another stadium. Um, this was Manhattan, where we were hired to design a retractable roof stadium to accommodate the Olympics and to accommodate football. And on this scheme, the whole bottom end of the building comes off. You can see where it changes the track and it goes so far and it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit further up, so we're up on this side. Um, you could see it, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my hand shakes it. Where is it? There? Yeah. Oh, all right. Just there. You have to pardon my hand. I, I'm, I'm shaked like a, a, an aspen leaf. So from there down, uh, all of those seats in there were temporary, and then the whole end came away, and it slid on a, on, well, it's in where you see it there, it's in its open position. It's already been pulled back. And when it, when they finished with the Olympics, the idea was to remove those seats, and then that would push back, leaving this site. However, um, Cohn Pedersen Fox got that job, and then Cohn Pedersen Fox lost it, you know, <laughs> after we'd had it. So again, it was the, the, the story. This was, this was Jetta Stadium that we, we all worked on together. Um, this one, we developed this, this retractable roof that spiraled open in two panels. They, they would spiral around and, and face each other. And that one would go on, the, this one would go on the other side and vice versa around these tracks. Um, and we used the same concept for Beijing. This was, I put this in, this was a building. We got a client who wanted us to build an indoor NASCAR track. This track is a mile long inside a building that would seat 177,000. The infield was over a million square feet. Um, the building was about 150 feet high. It was about, <coughs> I don't know, two and a half thousand feet long and one and a half thousand feet wide or something. It was a ridiculous scale. Um, however, um, unfortunately, just before he was getting ready to do something about it, he died. So, <laughs> that, you know, there, that was, the, that was the, the way it happens. So it was, it was intriguing. This was a version of it. This was a short track. This one was about th half a mile, three quarters of a mile. Um, and there's the 42 cars battling it out. Um, now, I've st stopped the pictures there. Um, and the rest of it I'm going to just say, because, because I come from another century, I don't have PowerPoint or anything like that. And <laughs> you've seen all that before. So the rest of what I did, what I worked on, I guess, in my career, um, was a lot of work on life science laboratories, because I was always intrigued by the, the complexity of these things um, and, the, uh, um, and the challenge of, of trying to accommodate these very picky scientists uh, in, some, in some sort of building which uh, might have some flexibility to it. Because I've, I've always been very interested in, in sort of modular construction and in flexibility and trying to get buildings that you can change around. So there was, um, there was a lot of, uh, <coughs> I did a lot of those and then I think worked on maybe or 40 of them. Um, and of course, schools have worked on about three to 400 schools um, in, uh, over my career. Um, you know, a lot of them obviously are repeats or tend to be repeat. 
But again, I, as when I was at CEF, I was a, an educational bureaucrat for three and a half years uh, at the Metropolitan Toronto School Board, and which gave me an interesting insight into the other side from where you usually are as an architect. So a lot, a lot of what I've done has been in trying to use um, sort of very rational, almost engineer-like means of arriving at solutions um, for buildings that when built will last a long time because um, I've always felt that we spend enormous amounts of a client's money to build these buildings and you know the, the least they can expect is that they will last a long time and work very well and hopefully um, not become obsolescent or obsolete which is worse um, very quickly you know so that they can things change and they can mutate and if you think of quite a few old buildings you know, like really old buildings or old you know from 100 200 years ago um, there was a tremendous number of these buildings that could survive from one set of functions to something quite different and still have a useful life in the in the new the new period of history and the other thing I, I when I worked on Frobisher which you saw at that, that town on Baffin Island um, it was the first time I had an interest in how you might use solar energy to try and save money on heating the space so the whole town was set up so it faced south and to grab all the sun and then the north side was virtually windowless because the the wind came off the pole on that side it was very 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 cold um, and uh, then from then on I'd, I'd always taken an interest in in energy and sustainability and because of in a funny strange way the the mechanical engineering background from which I came, uh, not in the classic sense, but in this strange beer parlor sense, you know, of the of the merchant marine, um, that it there there was a challenge in trying to make these buildings, in a sense, more responsive um, to the environment they find themselves in, which, in a sense, is is very anti-stylistic. It, uh, um, and this was born out in, in the 70s. Uh, I was asked and picked a bunch of people, about 18 of us, um, to do a report for the government that was subject to the Official Secrets Act, uh, which was commissioned by S Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation and the uh, then Ministry of of urban affairs or some name like that which they had at the federal level which has now disappeared um, and basically they, they gave me a piece of paper and it just said we want you to tell us how we can take all the residential accommodation in Canada both existing and new off fossil fuel and use solar so the answer was immediate you can't do it you know that was easy you know then they said, no, but that's not the answer we want to hear. So you go away and then tell us, like, what can we do and why can't we do it? So from that study, and it was, it was a bizarre kind of study because they wanted it done very quickly. So I just picked people who had a tremendous amount of knowledge about various things. So we, we went to all the engineering disciplines, planning, you know, telecommunications, power generation, da, 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 you know, the whole nine yards. And the, th the, the idea was what, what is likely to happen and what can we do about it? And so it, on the one hand, from a building science point of view, we, we looked for ways that you could save a lot of energy quickly. Um, and we came up with the idea, well, why don't we weather strip all the buildings in Canada? Like, that would surely have quite an effect. You know, and funnily enough, it did. Um, and also the other was the level of ins insulation but the funny thing the weather stripping thing or keeping the air out making buildings airtight in this very cold climate um, or at least the winter part of it obviously is when the heat gets used that um, th those sort of things 
found their way into the National Building Code and then into the Provincial Codes. And this was, uh, we did this study in 1976. Anyway, it sort of went to Ottawa in a printed form and disappeared, you know, which is most things that go to Ottawa disappear, you know. They, they have some big hole where they drop things in, you know, and it's gone. Anyway, so uh, there was a bunch of stuff came out of it, but what I found, one of the things we looked at was built forms you know, what are the rational built forms for building if you're really going to do something about trying to save energy? You know, you don't have all kinds of glass facing north in Canada. It kind of doesn't, because the sun never shines from the north in Canada. If you take and move it to Australia, then it might shine from the north, you know, but not in Canada. So you have buildings with all kind of glass on the north side, which kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even if it's funny glass, you know, which is supposed to be good. So it's better not to have any windows. So out of, from this, uh, there were a whole bunch of things like this, like these built forms. Um, um, Arun Sain and I won the first prize in the 1980 competition run by the government on energy, um, which to put some of this stuff, it, it attempted to put it in practice. But since then, I've, wherever I've had a chance, I've tried to harp to people, why don't we as architects um, come up with an actual architectural vernacular, like a, and a form of expression, a, a style, whatever you want to call it, I, I prefer the word vernacular, which is based on sustainability, based on en starting with energy conservation. The rest you can do, uh, the rest of it is m kind of my judgment, Mickey Mouse, you know, saving bits of wood and so on. But if you could save a ton of energy, especially high level electrical energy, you know, that you need to drive elevators and subway trains and things like that. This would then have some probably beneficial effect. Anyway, so that was, that was one thing that's come out of that and I'm still involved in that. That's one of the things I'm involved with at Young and Wright. Um, so what I did in, I, I had this firm, Robbie Sane, which basically went bankrupt. You know, we, we, were, we were insolvent so I had to close it, which is it's always a rather miserable thing to have to do when you get ancient. Um, so we shut that firm down, and then I went to, I had the other firm, Robbie and Wright, <coughs> so I, I just moved my carcass there. Well, it was there already, so I just joined it. Um, so uh, I, uh, uh, I worked there, you know, for quite a few years, and uh, in 2004, when I shut the other firm, a few months later, I handed in all my licenses. Um, and I was made chairman emeritus very kindly so I could get a pension. It's not a pension, it's a, it's a salary. So I'm an employee again, it's great. You know, I don't, even, I don't have any insurance or responsibility and nobody phones me and, you know, I don't have to do anything. I just come to the office when I feel like it. Uh, unfortunately, it's always 8.30 or, no, it isn't, is it? No, I, I won't lie, it's 9.30 in the morning, yeah. But I go home at 6. Anyway, so I, from all of this, um, I in recent years I figured that if there, if there would, was a way of figuring out this vernacular which probably doesn't have very much to do with just about every kind of picture you see in the in, you know in architectural record or you know the the magazine showing you know the latest art gallery or museum or something and most of these buildings have absolutely zero to do, in my judgment, with a responsible approach to getting buildings that will be affordable to operate from an energy standpoint and in the years ahead. Now, you know, you can add water to that and other things, but just starting with energy and using the least of it you can. And a great deal of it comes from urban design, you know, the planning of how these buildings are sited, uh, relatively to each other t to do with microclimate and also the buildings themselves. <laughs> anyway. Thank you very much. I joined NOR in 86 and I had the pleasure of working for three years full time uh, with Rod Robbie. Eva, I think you're the only one left. Did I miss anybody else? Gary. Gary <laughs> Um it was uh, it was uh, it was an interesting time, uh, but um, uh, it, it was interesting that 
I actually only got to see Rock uh, every I can't remember if it was Monday night or Tuesday night. Sorry, but yeah. Rod and I and Mike Allen would spend, I think we started at 5 o'clock every night and we'd go until about you know, 9 or 10. Yeah. Uh, and then a little bit after that. Yeah. But it wasn't working. Um, and, it, and it was a, an incredible time. I think what you've seen, um, certainly in the presentation, uh, is exactly the way that uh, Rod uh, lives, the way he lives, uh, the way he lives his life. And uh, yeah. it was an incredible time to go through. I think it was you know, about 60 hour yeah. weeks, and, and nobody really cared, <laughs> and nobody really felt uh, it. Uh, we had thought we were going to have a very large team, and certainly for myself. I was responsible for the uh, roof, um, and uh, uh, I think when I started, I, I thought I needed, uh, and this goes to the staff of meetings that we have, I thought we needed uh, 16 people, we can get it all done in uh, you know, six months and then we over with, and what we very quickly found out is that uh, the 16 people really didn't work, um, and it was incredible that I had Eva and one other lady that worked with me on the roof, and they were the only ones that could actually understand the roof, because it was a building that moved, it wasn't a building that was a static object, and trying to understand it was um, quite a quite a piece of itself. Um, anyways, it was, a, it was a great time uh, for us. Uh, we, we, we certainly learned a lot through that, and I just think that we could actually mentor and take that to uh, that experience to certainly the audience in this room or across the entire architectural world. One question that I would have uh, for you, Rod, and you've obviously seen, seen a lot, um, done a lot through your life. I think that your architecture um, certainly is, is different than those signature guys that run around like Carlos Sock. <laughs> um, but, you know, is, is there anything with respect to design that I think that you would like to certainly encourage the younger people? Well, I think first and foremost is... It sounds very trite, you know, is the function, is the usability of the buildings. Um, and they're perfect. But also, another thing is making these buildings, and you notice I won't, I won't talk about style, because I, I really basically despise it. And, you know, I always have done. I can't see how you can have just about every building coming out of your shop looking the same, you know, which seems to me to happen in certain firms that will be nameless. Um, everything of significance, that buildings are all sort of parodies of one great idea which has been worked over. It's, it seems to me that the buildings are for different owners, of different users, in different places. I mean, if they're all in the same country, they're still in different places. Therefore, there are differences which should be reflected. Yeah, they're all buildings, like we're all human beings, but we, we all look a little bit different. Um, that's one part. The other part is that is the, the, the Build the business of making buildings that will s stay together. I mean, there are buildings like, uh, again, it's the, the situation shall be nameless, but we've been in joint ventures where the other chap is the designer, and the, the materials and method of putting them together is so hokey, you know, and you say, you, you can't do this, this is Canada, it will disintegrate, and especially where the person doing it is Canadian, and you say, well, like, how can you do this? It, uh, so, like, please learn building construction, learn building science, and how these things go together and to make a, a, a building. Um, and also, bear in mind, buildings are, they're supposed to be permanent. It was only recently, you know, in the last 50 years or so, that the idea that a building was a kind of throwaway commodity, 30 years and you've had it and you knock it down, before that, you'd never knock them down. You couldn't afford to. And I don't think we can afford to either, it's social capital. But there's that part. But having said that, it doesn't mean to say you've got to have a lot of dull, mundane looking buildings that have perfect energy conservation and don't leak and all the rest of it. There has to be some way of creating a beautiful architecture that does this. That to me, is, that is the challenge, I think, is 
how do you make a beautiful architecture which is, grows right out of sustainability and grows out of proper use of materials and construction techniques. Um, you know, the other part is, like in our lifetime, things like, which unfortunately I bear some responsibility for, creating project management and construction management, which were part of the SEF program. <coughs> but these two in particular, um, and the advent of lawyers and accountants in the construction industry, have been, like, to my mind, a bane. You know, these, my original notion when I was directing SEF was that uh, the construction management is different. This was dealing with generals, but the project management was an architectural responsibility. It wasn't something that was going to be hived off into another kind of occupation who then got between the owner and the architect, which is what has happened. So I would appeal to you, all you younger people, throw them out, get it back, you know. Um, there are various things you've got to get back. You've got to get back project management, you've got to get back urban design, and you've got to get back interiors. Like, they're all part of architecture. Uh, but they've all become specializations, yeah, certainly in my lifetime. And that, I think, those are some of the things. But I would askew um, fashionable architecture. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to do, especially when people award prizes for copying the other guy, you know. But please be original, and please be smart. <laughs> When I was younger, what I didn't mention, I, I lived in Ottawa, but I had the opportunity of, of probably being able to have joined at least three development, what turned into development firms of some magnitude at a very senior level when they first started, because, you know, these guys were all around town. So, you know, you could go there, do that, and just, you know, in retrospect, make a huge pot of money. But... And this came back to the, the stress and whatever the rest of it was. Yeah, there was stress working for these guys. But the only thing is you'd, you'd build in your lifetime 400,000 houses. And you, you know, you'd just be like moribund with just drawing the same thing time, at, time again or getting somebody else to draw it. So you, if you're going to be an architect or if you choose to be an architect or if you choose to stay being an architect, you have to accept that it... It carries with it this responsibility, but also this delight. You know, it is a lot of fun, I've always felt. You know, bad as it is, it's still a lot of fun. And it's better than being a developer or a millionaire running a bank. You know, it, it actually is better because you deal with a lot of differences. You know, they, what they do, they do one thing and they do it well, and then they do it a, a million times. But you've, in the time they've done a million, well, the same thing, you've done a hundred thousand different things, you know, so that this is where the delight is. So yeah, the stress, you have to learn to deal with the stress. There is no way around it. Otherwise, you have to quit because it won't get any better, is, is my, my view. There are no other questions. I have uh, a drawing that I did when I was 16 years old. You, you showed us your drawing. Yeah. And I'd like to share my drawing with you. <laughs> and I happened to go to the high school, and I found this. I've had it in the basement all of these years. We're uh, uh, it's a secondary school, and uh, we took drafting. Um, and one of the things that we had to do, obviously, the architecture guys had to distinguish themselves from the electrical guys and the auto shop guys and everyone else. So. Um, I designed the, uh, the crest, and of course the class uh, selected mine, and I'd like to uh, put it on. It actually still fits. <laughs> and it came out of our trip to Expo 67. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> and uh, uh, obviously it won. Everybody see that? <laughs> and you can also see that. <laughs> uh, but it... it uh, it's something that I've had in my past all of these years, and I just pulled it out. Oh, uh, God. I, I never knew that, uh, you know, in 1986, we'd be able to work together. Uh, yeah. And I just said, there are only a few buildings in everybody's lifetime that you actually do, that you remember for the rest of your life, and you really treasure. And certainly, uh, Skybone is one for me. Uh, and uh, it was a great... Uh, 
have a quick on that. Was it? This guy, this guy, might add, was the greatest because he didn't quite tell you what he did. He did all the outside as well as the roof of this guy, and we just gave the whole miserable thing, like all of it. And then we fought with Bill of Brisbane Brook Bain and about the inside because they wanted to take it off us, you know. She remembered it was. We, we can have some more water and talk about that later. This is a small, small token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. I'm going to ask you a question for you. Yeah. I didn't know what you were going to talk about. Oh, <laughs> So, hopefully you'll be, uh, you'll enjoy this. And it actually has that. Ah, uh, oh, that for me now. <laughs> <laughs> So you can see, I only hope that the rest of the speakers who come here talk about architecture in a more expected way than I have. So. Actually, quite, quite honestly, I think that this was a, a great session for our yeah. first session. Um, obviously, as I said at the beginning, this is not just architecture, but it's engineering, uh, and there is no line between the two, and certainly we, we practice it uh, from a day-to-day -day basis, and I think that we have to try to uh, find it again because I think for the last little while we've just been worrying too much about uh, a lot of other things uh, and, and certainly Rod has lived it all of his life and uh, I, mean, I, it, I could see him if he was probably in, uh, in So I'm going to ask the panel to please come on and as you can see I'm still wearing the Rod Robbie jacket. So I'm going to start and introduce the four panelists. And I'm going to start with uh, Caroline Robbie, who is the principal and head of interiors and media environment at BDP. Caroline's aesthetic was formed by an early exposure to how built form and the decorative arts affect one's quality of life from her artist mother and architect father. Caroline is a graduate of the Ontario College of Art and Interior Design from Toronto Metropolitan University. She has led teams on numerous design forward and award-winning projects, including Chorus Entertainment, Deluxe Studios in Toronto, Los Angeles, and New York, Sharp Center of Design at OCAD University, and Sky Dome. Jeff Smith is President and Chief Executive Officer of Ellis Don. Jeff earned his law degree from the University in Toronto and was admitted to the uh, Ontario Bar in 1981. After joining Ellis Don in 1983, he quickly gained experience across various management positions. Jeff was named the President and CEO of Ellis Don in 1996 and reinvented Ellis Don as a cradle to grave service provider with guaranteed performance outcomes through his its capital services, facilities management, and sustainable building divisions. Jamie Wright graduated from Dalhousie University in Architecture in 1967. He is a fellow of the RAIC and recipient of the Order of Da Vinci. Jamie and Richard Young formed Robbie Young and Wright Architects with Rod in 1982 to undertake the A&E services for Sky Dome with Nor and Agilian Allen Rubley as part of the RAND Consortium. Following Sky Dome, Jamie worked extensively with Rod on many of RAND's retractable roof stadium projects. Chris Andrews is a structural engineer graduating from Carleton University, his Bachelor of Engineering in 1979. Chris brings over 40 years of professional experience in conceptual planning, detailed design, and construction of buildings. Chris has acted as principal in charge of redevelopment of Maple Leaf Garden Sports Facility Toronto and has acted as site engineer for design and construction of Skydome. Welcome to all four of you. 
I had to wear this jacket because the film ends off at this jacket. And it's a very special jacket for me, not only because of Rod, but the high school that I went to was designed by the firm that I work for, the John B. Parkin firm. And so it brings back some very, very special memories. So um, I'm going to start this discussion off with a simple question for all of the panelists. And I'm going to ask each of you to talk about your very, very special story of Rod Robbie. And I'm gonna start off with Caroline. Thanks, Silvio. Um, it's, uh, it's really fun for me to watch that again. Um, uh, and what I hadn't realized is I, I hadn't watched it again until right now how many things that I was going to talk about actually touch on some of the things that he said. So in thinking about a story, there's too many. So I thought I'd, I'd rather pick some themes. And there's three recurring themes that I've always uh, associated with my father. The, the first and most important one to him was architecture. And it's the profession for you. And he would berate, he would, he would berate anybody and try and convince them to become architects. And he, uh, it's funny that he told the story because if he won the barbering scholarship, uh, none of us would be sitting here right now. Um, and he, he also tried to indoctrinate um, all of his children. And I'm gonna just quickly share uh, some, oops, sorry, giving it all away. Um, he tried to indoctrinate all of us uh, into becoming um, architects. Uh, I'm the only one he managed to actually convince. So here's a shot. He showed that picture of uh, being a royal engineer in, in Egypt, and here he is actually in situ. Um, and, you know, this is the view that I remember from him. And being um, at uh, the, the site of Expo in, in 67 with my mother and my sisters, um, he definitely made sure that our holidays always had something to do with architecture. Um, and this is probably why I hate the color yellow because he had a very strong idea of how children should be visible. But he did actually uh, convince me to go into architecture and Skydome was actually my first job working with him. And you know, it was, it was a very important project for all of us. And I'm very happy to be sitting actually on the site of the Globe and Mail which he would have nuked in his initial Colosseum piece that he was talking about. And I've got the building um, behind my right shoulder and I get to see it every day. So that's, um, that's something that's really special for me. Um, the second main theme was always keep some sense of humor um, about your daily life. And so most social occasions that involved my dad were always quite a lot of fun. This is him making fun of uh, the client in Japan. I think Jamie took this picture. Um, this was him at my wedding reception, uh, kissing the Rock's uncle, uh, who was our next door neighbor. Um, and yes, that, uh, that street party really did take place. But, um, the, you know, the, the other really important theme that I continue to think about was the fact that he had this idea of world domination. And it didn't matter what it is that you described to him about something that you wanted to do. He was going to spin it up over the course of several glasses of Merlot into an industry defining um, you know, project that would lead to fame and fortune. And it, uh, it never, he never stopped that. And uh, those are the things that I always think about in those themes when I think of my dad. Jeff. Well, I start immediately, sorry. Okay, terrific. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Silvio, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and revisit uh, uh, my old friend. He was more my dad's friend than he was mine, but I was honored to consider him a friend. I got two points and, and then a story. One, easy to be amazed by the innovation. You just saw it in a speech uh, from, from 10 or 12 years ago, but think about it. In the 50s, he was talking about modular which we still haven't figured out in novel uses of precast fiberglass chairs and pogo poles and, and sustainability. And just to put a point, we've all, all of us, I think have been thinking about sustainability as it relates to design and construction for about 36 months now. He thought about it, Rod thought about it for 36 years. 
and, and he's been dead 10 years. My point, the reason I wanted to bring this up is the one thing I've learned in my career is that, is that that kind of innovation takes huge courage. And the reason it takes huge courage is because you are necessarily standing alone. By definition, if you're an innovator, you're doing things differently from everybody else. Everybody else is standing over there and they're generally making fun of you because you're a threat to them. And Rod I, I was, was really, I hope my panelists will agree, was never really part of the establishment. He was never going to be part of the establishment. And he was probably the subject of a few snickers in his, in his time. But that's what it takes to be a great innovator and a great leader. That's what I was thinking about when I saw it. And the guy was a genius, pure and simple. Second point, you might wonder, let me put my contractor's hat on, what builders and contractors think of you, know, you might think we're threatened by like who wants to work for one of these rock stars who's got everything perfect and the designs are outrageous and it's all brand new like sky dome and i can tell you the answer is that we are thrilled by it we're not afraid of innovation and change we embrace it especially when the guy says and you just heard him he said learn construction science and building materials he said i despise style but that never stands in the way of great architecture one real quick story i watched him just a few days ago in a film we made for my dad, where he said when they first moved that quartile piece of the, the, the first, uh, the nesting piece at Skydome, he was standing down with the steel workers or with a steel worker. And he said he turned and the steel worker was crying. And he turned to him and he said, what are you crying? The steel workers don't cry. You're the toughest guys in the world. And the steel worker looked up and he said, it's being born. My point there is if you can inspire steel workers, and you can, of course, then the rest is uh, the rest is easy. You've already done the rest, but that's that's rod around inspiring people right down to the, the right down to the ground. And my story is this, and it's about the absolute, and the only word I come up with is aliveness of Rod Robbie and, and how alive you were when you were with him. So my story, which the others have heard is that one day in the 90s when times were tough, I wrote Rod a letter and it was a stupid letter. I can't remember what it was about. It was an undoubtedly childish and, and ill-informed. And he wrote me a letter back. And the first sentence was, your letter of, of October the 14th dropped like a steaming turd on my desk today, unquote. <laughs> and I never received, and clearly I'd offended one of the great architects in the country. So I called him up and I said, Rod, blah, blah, blah. I'm so sorry. I got to come and buy you lunch, whether you like it or not. So I went down and, and I got to saw his office in St. George. We walked down to this really shabby kind of an English pub. And as soon as we walked in, the waitress came over, didn't say a word, dropped a bottle of wine on our table, walked away. No man used nothing. We drank that whole bottle of wine. Before a menu came, I had to call my secretary and say, cancel all my meetings, told my car, I, I'm into something here. We drank a couple of bottles of wine that day. And all I can tell you is I learned more about life. I learned more about design. I learned more about politics and the origin of the Sky Dome and about entrepreneurialism. Rod was a great entrepreneur, not a terrifically good one, but a, but a very pioneering entrepreneur than you would learn in three MBA courses at at Rotman, that was the kind of guy he was. He was entirely alive. Over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Um, hard to follow Jeff with his uh, enthusiasm. Uh, and thanks, uh, thanks uh, Sylvia, for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, you know, it's hard to summarize what you think about Rod, having spent 30 years with him. Um, and I could go on forever. But you know, I think if there was a term architect's architect, that's what Rod really was. Uh, when you boiled it down. I mean, he could draw better than you. He could work faster and harder than you. I mean, he could do watercolors. He knew all about building science, as <clears throat> everybody said. Uh, but also, he was, uh, he was very generous and kind and, uh, and, and uh, humble, which is not terms that you normally aspire to or you know, qualify of to architects. Um, so he was fun to work with. I mean, he, you know, as long as you get to your end, uh, he was there as always there for you. Uh, so I, I enjoyed all those years that I spent with him. And I, like Jeff and everybody, I'm sure learned a lot uh, through the piece. Um, if, you know, I have thousands of stories, 
the one that I think uh, uh, you know comes to mind is about the award of uh, Skydome. And uh, as as Rod was saying in his piece, um, when he started, when the design build competition for Skydome came out, Rod had his own small firm and decided to put throw his hat in the ring. Uh, Richard and I uh, tried constantly to talk him out of it. We would go and have lunch with him. We would say, you know, it's going to be a political decision. It's going to be based on the cost of construction. It's going to be all the things that that Rod, you know, hated, right? About how you would win something because uh, it just seemed insurmountable to to win the. We we decided, for instance, not to go into it, although we'd been involved in in one of the sites previously. Um, in any event, uh, Rod finally called us near the end and said, I need to have a couple of people help draw this up. And we said, sure, but, you know, we're giving them to you, but you're not going to win. So, you know, it's just, <laughs> just face up to it. Um, and I think Carolyn will be uh, a witness to this. He spent the entire Christmas holidays uh, at his dining room table drawing. I think uh, that's, I'm accurate, aren't I, Carolyn? I mean, he just, he, you know, he worked his tail off right at the yeah, end. Yeah, he, they... 45 minutes, the the uh, the drawings and the model came off the table for the for the turkey, and that was it. So, so uh, you know, we all the the submission went in, and we all forgot about it. And then Rod called one day on a Monday, I'm sure it was, over a weekend, and said we won. And I said we won what? And we weren't <laughs> even we then; we were just we were just friends, right? He said we won Skydome. I said that's impossible. That is not possible that you would have won Skydome. But of course, you know. As Rod said, uh, you know, the rest is history. Um, so that's really my story. The only other thing that I might add is, um, you know, when you work with Rod, you know, you never ended up on a project where you started. So, you know, I, my line was Rod never met a project he couldn't make bigger. I mean, he would say more meaningful, and I'm sure they were both the same. But one of his pieces of advice was to me some, at some point, you know, if you can't make it any better or bigger or more meaningful, just give the client more, the users more space because they can always use more space for the same budget. So, you know, there's, they all ring in my ear now, all these uh, lines that Rod left with us. I'm sure uh, Chris following me now will uh, have others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie and, and everybody. And, and thanks for inviting me. You know, I knew Rod for 27 years. Um, there are times when I worked with them almost 24 hours a day and you know times during the sky dome it was like that there were times when i didn't see rod for two three four five years and then there were times when rod would kind of come back into the life of what i was doing the life of what i was doing in running structural engineering firms and then the life of you know getting work and doing work and all the things that you do um you know but the thing that that I sort of took away from Rod in a way and, and took away from watching this video again once more was, you know, he had this way of pushing you or driving you or, you know, exciting you to do things that you didn't believe you could do. You, I mean, it sounds kind of, I don't know, a little light or something, but he just had this way about him. You know, and, and Jamie just talked about the Sky Dome. I mean, who would have thought that he would have won that thing? Who would have thought that, you know, him and Mike could have figured out this roof? Who would have thought that Ellis Dawn could actually build this thing in three years? We can't build a project like that right now with all the skills and the, and the software and all the project management that we do. But we did it, you know, and, and he had this way of kind of, leading you to a place of very special things that you could do where you could do things that you didn't think you could do it was you know it was fun it was interesting it was tough at times and challenging rod was you know not maybe not the most organized person in the world um his mind worked in a different way i think um his soul worked in a different way his art worked in a different way but what a guy to work with and uh i'll never forget him and i'll never forget those times and my one story, you know, my story is, well, I'll just call it the first meeting. And this was the first big team meeting in Ellis Dawn. Um, you know, I, I still remember it. I can remember it as clear as can be. Jess Father's in there. Um, I think there's 50 or 60 people around the table. And it's design build. And design build has a lot of commitment about time and money. And on this project, people's careers are on the line, the company's on the line, you know? Um, 
And so it starts off with the usual things about going through schedules, going through costs, going through org charts and all the rest of it. And, you know, Rod just sort of, you know, when it got to Rod, he, he stood back and he just said, I'm going to talk about the guiding principles of design for the Skydome. You know, the guiding principles of design for the Skydome. So he talks about the functionality. The roof is really open. It's multi-use. He talked about the safety and the redundancy. He talked about the buildability, the fact that we're using conventional materials and we're using conventional design stuff up on the bogies on the roof. Um, he talked about the fact that it would last 100 years. And then he talked about the beauty of it. He talked about these parabolic arches. And I'm going, oh, my God, like this is design build. And, and but what he did in that meeting was he defended his design and he did two other things with the group that was kind of sitting around there. He, he gave us a place and a commitment of how we were going to build it because the roof just opened up to the north. So we were going to start at the north and get that done quickly and then we could roll the roof around. That was a really important thing. And the other thing that he did in that, in that very first meeting, and we all kind of came around, we all agreed on that thing, is we agreed that we would get it done and we would fight about it later. And that's what we did. And so we kind of were able to survive the, the three and a half years of the challenges and the fightings and the pushes and the pulls and the design group actually working for Ellis Dom, which was not an easy thing on a design build project. And those were the things that he did. He defended his design and you know he kind of set this thing in motion of let's get it done and fight about it later. And most importantly for me, and I think for a lot of people, he gave us a sense of the ability to do things that we couldn't do. And for that, I really thank him. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. I, um, I just want to say I, I talk too much in the, in the film. Uh, I, just, I just want to pick on something that, that Chris just said, just to extend that. I mean, one of the things that, you know, we work with Rod. I work with Rod like for three years. And then I went on with Jamie, with Ran International, with a whole series of stadiums that we looked at. But I want to, there's a lot of people that are on the line right now that, you know, are doing buildings in BIM and Revit and all of this thing. And I had a meeting today and where we're trying to decide, you know, it's, it's just like a $25 million project supposed to be done in, you know, a couple of years. And, you know, Chris just touched on three years, you know, and people are worrying about BIM and Revit. And Rod gave me something on the first day. Skydome has 13 radius points. And, <laughs> You know, 13 radius points. And Rod gave me this on day one. It's a beam compass and it's rods. And he said, this is how we're gonna do it. We drew every single drawing on a layered system and the BIM guys don't know what that is today. But in, in three years, we did all of the drawings. We did it manually. There was no BIM. And when you think of that, what we did and as architects and engineers, what Ellis Don did in three years, I it's totally remarkable. agree with Chris. It it was totally remarkable. And we opened opened the building, and yeah, the the fire department was there because it yeah. wasn't totally ready to be open. <laughs> but we got it done. It yeah. opened, yeah. and it was just remarkable. And I, you know, I I remember what Rod did. He ran from meeting to meeting to yeah. meeting, and that's why I used to see him on Monday night. He, he yeah, used to why. he used to complain endlessly about walking into rooms and having people being pissed off because they'd been waiting for yeah. him because he was running yeah. from the last meeting, but he wouldn't give up whatever it was he was talking about in the yeah. last meeting before he got to the next meeting yeah. if people didn't get it. Yeah. And, and, and Chris is absolutely right. I was supposed to have 16 people. We did it with three people. And it's not a matter of having more people, but having, as Jeff has said a million times, you know, smart people and the right people sitting at the table. And that's what Rod was about, surrounding himself with good people and the right people. And the people, as Chris has said, you know, wanting to really make something happen. And it didn't matter how much time you spent with them. And the bottles of wine were fantastic. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jeff, yeah. I mean, there was yeah. always the bottle of wine. Yeah. <clears throat> Several bottles. Of and wine. we get these calls. Remember, we get these calls from Rod. You get them in the middle of the night. Well, I'm going to design a new, uh, a new residential station on the moon, you know, like a lunar station or an Antarctic thing or an arena in Moscow, you know, you get these calls and he would just draw you in and you just go, 
a hundred percent with them on these things. It was it was great. It was fun too. It was I really love, fun. I love I love Jamie's <laughs> anecdote about the fact that he was always afraid of leaving junior architects with him because they go out for lunch with dad and the small they project they back. were working on would come back and it would be <laughs> out of be control. Useless. That's right. You know, I don't think that people the people listening it, it's it's hard to imagine now just how. It upended everything when when Rod and Ran and, and Ellis Don won the Sky Dome. It was so unlikely that even his good friend Jamie Wright couldn't believe it when it happened. And Rod drove that. He went to see my dad, and we were not mainstream. Eastern no. was mainstream. PCL mm -hmm, was mainstream. Mm -hmm. He was kind of stuck with us because the mainstream people wouldn't pick him because he was too Rod, probably, Carolyn. I hope that's not upsetting. He was the little guy. He was the little guy. And so we went off and as you just all have said, and and changed and ch just changed the world. It upended the establishment when that happened. And this, the second thing I want to say as a contractor was, I think it was just under uh, three years, but when we started, there was a big uh, water treatment plant in the middle of the plant, yeah. in the middle of the yeah. site. So that you had to get you had to build it, you had to take it down while you were building it. And the thing I want to say is, we brag about that as contractors, it cannot be done without great design and without great designers who will work with work together with you to do that. It's not possible. Yeah. That's what was the magic of that. Thing. You yeah. know what I want to tie in on that point with uh, Silvio's, I remember being a house, I think we were surprised or we were happy that the last bent, you know, you poured the bents, I think in six bent sections and the mm -hmm. last bents with a pin system uh, matched the first bent when we got around to that point, and the chance of that happening was probably pretty remarkable. You know, that's that's uh, that's uh, Ellis Don's uh, acumen, but also uh, Sylvia, your your drawing skills. I mean, how did that happen without computers? How did those things line up? It's 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 a miracle, really. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, you know, people people don't realize. I mean, you know, uh, you know, a circle with one radius point is one thing, but uh, 13 radius points, and that was all driven by the sight lines in, in the seats, but yeah. but it, it, it was insane. I mean, you know, if you can do the, you know, the Colosseum in Rome, you can do this, right? Yeah. You know, but, you know, yeah. it, it took a, a, an incredible uh, amount of effort, and it was seamless. Obviously, the, the roof was the other thing, I and mean, I, I don't know how many failures we had on the seals. I mean, Ellis Don, we went to Sealmaster. That's what they carried in in the submission. And when we went to see Sealmaster in Ohio or wherever they were, they said, "Oh, we carried the six inch bubble." Well, when we did, we ran through all of the numbers. We needed something that was 750 millimeters round. And they said, "Forget it. We can't do that." We actually, Rod and I and Carl and Donald's office actually developed it, and we developed it with Ellis Don. And so it, the solution was. It took us two and a half years, but it, it was trial and error. And I can't tell you how many times we failed, but we persevered and the system is still there today. You know? Good thing that the seal was towards the end of the work. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you remember how, as it was being built, the media and others went out and hired global experts who came in and assessed and, and got in the paper saying it will never work. The yeah. thing was half built and all these great global experts, because we're Canadians, we don't believe in ourselves, we're saying it will never work. Yeah. It, was, it was, and then, you know, it was striking. And I the only way, and the only reason they, they crashed it was that they defeated all of the systems that were meant to stop that happening. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, I, I jumped I, on. No, I was, gonna, I was gonna say too, and you know, when we were working on it and designing it and, you know, down in the trenches of building this thing, I, I mean, I didn't hear many people ever say this thing's not going to work like everybody really had that feeling it was going to work and they had a feeling it was going to work i think in some ways i mean there was all the team stuff that you know it was really important but the idea of this roof the idea of the roof that kind of slid on these linear rails and this nesting thing that kind of tucked in was such a nice great brilliant idea and you know, it just made sense. I could tell my mother this thing and she could figure it out in 10 minutes after I explained it to her, you know, and that was so basic and fundamental, I think, to the success was that was that idea of the roof and the way the roof worked. And, you know, when we had that, you know, I don't know, I thought probably we'd win it. And when we had that, I knew we could build it. And uh, it's great to see it. It's great to see it still kind of up there and 
and and and operating and it's great to see it you know when you come down the garden and you see that kind of parabolic arch out there it's a quite a beautiful thing actually it's nice mm -hmm. we're kind of at at the end of this session i want to pick up on uh, jeff because i yeah. think you know when you when you take a look at the video that we've seen it was our very first norad and i think he was the best speaker we've ever had he was the first and he's the best i mean he's an architect inventor a partner a mentor he's a teacher he's a humanist and he's a friend of all of ours you know and and i sincerely miss him but you know he was so far ahead like I mean, it was 15 years ago that we did this and and jeff is absolutely right like i mean we're we're nowhere further than we were 15 years ago and he was talking about things that you know caroline today i mean your firm my firm you know jeff's firm uh, jamie you know firm you're with the, the uh, chris you're at the university you're teaching at the university and you know the universities are still trying to grapple with things that rod summarized at the very end of, yeah. of that north right, right. end yeah. and yeah and and we're we're all still struggling i don't think we have the answers but but he was such a visionary not 50 years ago he was a visionary you know when he was born i mean i mean to to go through his life and you know uh, the way he brought up his family the way he he worked with people jamie you know i mean i'm sure he when when he worked with you and he at the beginning and at the end you know when he was with you i mean he certainly affected my life chris yours and all of our lives and but to hear him talk in that um uh, recording at the end he it was, was brilliant far, actually he was brilliant to hear him talk again you know? he, he loved, was, he loved hearing so his voice again far ahead of all of us i'm glad that we did this i'm glad that all of you were part of this panel and um this video is going to be a, a recording certainly that uh, people will have uh, for the future and i really want to thank you caroline for being part of it and thank and being you part so of much this, this session jeff yeah you're 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 a good friend and uh, I'm, I'm glad you were on this and uh, to, to contribute to this jamie thanks for having me jamie thank you, th thank you. For, for being on this. And Chris, as always, we, and as we all said, we've got to get together and uh, celebrate this uh, again. And for the people that Some wine. were on this, uh, this was, uh, an, again, a, a historic moment, certainly for us and, um, you know, to the memory of Rod Robbie. Thank you all. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.